so this is a story about ethnographic collecting. It's also a story about what are the scientific and social motivations that are driving a process by which uh, Europeans, and specifically here, I'm going to talk about um, those in Victorian England, which is to say England between 1837 and 1901, during the reign of Queen Victoria, um, encountered and collected the material artifacts of much of the world. Um, and I'm going to particularly look at um, collections of artifacts um, by Inuit peoples of uh, the polar areas of the Western Hemisphere. So. Um, I'm going to start this story um, by looking at the specific collections um, that were um, brought together by members of the Royal Navy um, and end it um, with John Lubbock, uh, one of the founders of modern archaeology, uh, and trace the connection between them in terms of the Inuit artifacts that they shared. So. Um, and I'm using this as a way for us to ask what it is that motivates collecting. In telling the story, I draw on an article from 2006 by Janet Owen, which in her words, focuses on the relationship between the collecting activities of an early 19th century Arctic explorer, Lieutenant Edward Belcher, and a late 19th century Darwinist, Sir John Lubbock. She summarizes the role of the Royal Navy by writing that the Admiralty, which is to say the high command of the Royal Navy, um, its instructions, quote, made no specific reference to the scientific importance of collecting ethnographic material. The British Museum incorporated ethnographic material brought back from exploration into displays that organized material geographically into regions across the world. The public who visited these galleries were more interested in the exoticism of difference represented by these artifacts and how they define their own European identity through contrast rather than any interest in a deeper understanding of the cultures that created them. There were no detailed research questions or instructions that informed ethnographic collecting on the HMS Blossom, one of the Royal Navy's ships on which Belcher sailed. Its content was dictated by the geographical coverage of the expedition, what could fit into the ships, the generosity of the local people and availability of stock, for example. So here are some of the specific uh, admiralty instructions. Quote, you are to cause it to be understood that two specimens, at least, of each article are to be reserved for the public museums, after which the naturalist and the officers will be at liberty to collect for themselves. You will pay every attention in your power to the preservation of the various specimens of natural history, and on your arrival to England, transmit them to this office. So the process of acquiring goods um, for ethnographic collections was definitely something that was coordinated by the British government by way of the Royal Navy, and then was immediately connected to public museums like the British Museum um, as places of display. Um, it was a systematic part of imperial policy. Um, and so I want to give you a sense of both the kinds of communities that Belcher visited um, and a little bit of a sense of some of the artifacts. So this is a drawing um, of a Bering Sea village on Nunavik Island um, in the mid 19th century, right? So uh, uh, illustrating both igloos uh, and practices of uh, fishing and hunting uh, and also the landscape as well. Um, and here is some 19th century Inuit sculpture um, that is in a Minneapolis museum collection. So um, some of the artifacts, uh, just three of them, that Belcher collected ended up in the collection of John Lubbock, um, who had an elaborate collection of archaeological and ethnographic artifacts. Um, there he numbered um, 1,331 items um, at his death. Um, about 32% of those were so-called ethnographic items, which is to say um, items collected from living cultures um, in the way that um, uh, I'm describing here and that Owen uh, traces from um, Belcher to Lubbock. And 83 of them, so a substantial portion of them, uh, were Inuit items. Uh, John Lubbock um, is uh, known as a founding figure in modern archeology. span um, he wrote a book called Prehistoric Times, of which more in a minute. Um, he was also a banker, um, the president of the London Chamber of Commerce for four years, um, and a member of parliament. Um, but as a kind of amateur scientist, he served as uh, the president of the Eth 
Ethnological Society, of the Linnaean Society, of the International Congress of Prehistoric Archaeology, the Royal Statistical Society, and is vice president of the Royal Society, basically the highest uh, scientific body in the United Kingdom. So a, a very prominent figure in uh, 19th century science, science, as well as a major advocate um, for um, the acceptance of Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, nonetheless, his most famous work um, is this book, um, which I've mentioned in class before, Prehistoric Times, as illustrated by ancient remains in the manners and customs of modern savages. Um, so this book, which was first published in 1865, became a standard archaeology textbook for the remainder of the century, um, and it was, went, came out in seven different English editions, um, English as in uh, in the country of England, um, with the final edition published in 1913. Um, and these editions sold over 20,000 copies. It's translated into several languages, and the American edition almost sold out within two days of its first publication, right? So this extremely influential document, um, which is very much in the tradition of uh, Tyler and Morgan of understanding of um, you know, quote unquote, contemporary savages um, as examples of the precursors and the histories of, uh, you know, present day European peoples. Um, as I've mentioned um, before in this class, um, John Lubbock does not have a very positive view of contemporary savages. He, in fact, says they may be likened to children. This comparison is highly instructive. Um, and uh, argued that they are both like morally and mentally defective. Um, and a really dramatic component of this book is devoted to, um, you know, elaborating on this thesis. Um, so while there's a lot of description of art and artifacts, there's also a lot of description of um, mentality and character. So um, even though it appears that Lovick, you know, acquired um, this massive amount of artistic material from Inuit peoples and about half of the illustrated uh, ethnographic objects that are in the entire book are uh, Inuit productions, as he calls them, Eskimo. Um, they, um, a lot of the, um, the book is, is really devoted to evaluating the, um, in his view, inferior and defective character um, of the morality um, of, uh, of Eskimos. Um, and so, uh, and this is one of the, the several examples when I uh, give talks on uh, science and race, um, where I have gone through the work of reading bigoted accounts so that you don't have to. Um, nonetheless, to give you a sense of this, right, um, in laying out and describing Inuit peoples, he describes them as excessively dirty, not knowing the difference between being dirty and clean, um, as intentionally deceitful, as wavering and inconstant, um, and so on. Um, and so you have this really, um, you know, this is the framework into which um, these artifacts are being used to place uh, indigenous peoples and particularly uh, the Inuit. Um, and what's interesting about this is that Le it's not that Lubbock is unaware of either the trade relationships that led to um, the artifacts being in his hands, or even, um, but even of accounts of contemporary Europeans who actually were on the front lines of these conversations. Um, so for example, he quotes um, Captain William Edward Perry um, writing in 1824 as saying, quote, in the few opportunities we had of putting their hospitality to the test, we had every reason to be pleased with them. I can safely affirm with Cartwright that um, thus lodged beneath their roof, I know no people whom I would trust, whom I would more confidently trust as respects either my person or my property than the Eskimo. Um, nonetheless, uh, Lovick, uh, literally on the other side of the page, comes to this conclusion. Uh, Though not cruel, the Eskimo seem to be a somewhat heartless people. They do not, indeed, feel any actual pleasure in the infliction of pain, but they will take little trouble to remove or relieve suffering. They are also great thieves. Um, so a lot of attention is coming out of Lubbock towards, um, you know, obtaining and characterizing these artifacts, towards uh, lovingly illustrating them in great detail in his books. Um, but at the same time, um, he's inserting them into a, like, highly moralistic and ethnocentric and obviously racist moral um, uh, intellectual framework in which um, they go on to prove their uh, positioning and the relative positioning of um, his own culture. So 
um, Owen summarizing writes that um, while Cap uh, Lieutenant Belcher's collecting activities were undoubtedly inspired by scientific interest and a duty to trade and maintain relationships uh, with the indigenous communities of Northwest Alaska, um, um, a further personal motivation may have been a desire to compete with other collectors on board. And there's evidence that he saw collections as a symbols of status and authority, both during the expedition and his return home. On the other hand, at the other end of this transaction and this transfer of um, these cultural properties, um, you see in Lubbock, the meeting of these uh, artifacts and other Alaskan Eskimo and uh, Canadian Inuit material was transformed in the late 19th century from objects of scientific curiosity and record into concrete evidence authenticating concepts of human progress, Western superiority, and imperial expansion.